going to present my own work, but also the work of many colleagues at Laval University in Quebec City. Uh, this study was already presented uh, uh, by a few speakers before me, uh, including by Dr. Carmen Sayon. This is a, a, a very important study because, as she mentioned, uh, this is really uh, demonstrating at the level of epidemiology that uh, there are uh, some foods that are good in order to prevent weight gain and some, good, some foods that are not good in terms of preventing weight gain. And some are, are obviously obvious, like the potato chips, uh, and uh, sweeteners, like potato chips here, and the uh, sugar-sweetened beverage. Obviously, we already knew these were causing a problem in terms of weight gate regulation. What was really important in that study, of course, was the discovery later on uh, that fruits and yogurt, so not all dairies are equal. Yogurt, in particular, uh, is associated with a reduction in weight gain in this very important uh, study. And this is associated with, with fruits, again. And this was mentioned also by the previous uh, presenter. And this is very important. Every time we show pictures of uh, yogurt, like for example here, when we present pictures of yogurt, usually we also present fruits. Most people, at, at least I think most people, should have plain yogurt in association with fruits like berries. Because as you will see later, I think the prebiotic component of fruits is really helping the probiotic component of yogurt to work and to improve the metabolic syndrome. But yogurt has been also associated more recently, not only with the preven prevention of weight gain, but also with a lower incidence of type 2 diabetes. There were a few studies that were published in the last four or five years, but really this study uh, by Dr. Forui and colleagues uh, of the EPIC Norfolk study Really, uh, under, really help us to understand more clearly the link between yogurt consumption and the incidence of type 2 diabetes, because of course this, uh, uh, this cohort is more than 4,000 people. Uh, there was uh, almost 900 incident case of diabetes during the follow-up, so this, is, this was a great opportunity to follow the incidence of type 2 diabetes in association with yogurt consumption. And of course they look at other dairies as well. And what they found is if you consider the low-fat fermented product to start with, there's already a 24% reduction in type 2 diabetes risk that you can see in this population. In fact, if you then look specifically at yogurt intake, you see that there's a 28% reduction in the risk to develop type 2 diabetes in this population. And you can also appreciate that the consumption level was not very high. We're talking here about 80 grams of yogurt per day or 4.5 servings of yogurt per week. I would not say that, I would not say that this is a massive uh, intake of yogurt, obviously, but this was already enough to uh, predict or to help prevent the incidence of type 2 diabetes. In that particular study, they really adjusted for several factors, of course, BMI, energy levels, and even uh, socioeconomical status of the uh, subjects in that study. Now, almost at the same time that this study was published in Diabetology, which is a very good journal in diabetes field, um, there was also this study by Chen et al., and, uh, and this is in BMD, uh, BMC Medicine. This is the same group. This is the Frank Wu uh, group in Harvard that have also published their own results with the uh, NERS study, uh, where they look at the ability or the association between incidence of type 2 diabetes and yogurt intake. And again, as shown in uh, Nitas Farui's study in Diabetologia, uh, they were able to see that there is, in their study, uh, a reduction in the risk to develop type 2 diabetes with more yogurt consumption. And the reduction of the risk, if you consider the meta-analysis, because they have compared their own studies with many others, unfortunately not Nita Farui's study because it was published almost at the same time. But even if you consider their studies and the other one, and some of them have different weight in the meta-analysis, you can see that there's about a 20% and significant reduction in the risk to develop type 2 diabetes in high consumers or consumers of yogurt. So again, uh, clearly demonstrating, at least at the epidemiological level, that more yogurt consumption is associated with less risk of both obesity and type 2 diabetes. So the reason I'm here, I guess, is trying to help you understand why is it the case? 
why yogurt is so good for us, why does it help prevent type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular risk, and even help to manage our body weight. And of course, this is a, a, a question that everybody working in this field is asking, and it's very important to understand. Well, first of all, first of all it's important to understand that to start with, yogurt is a dairy product, so it contains high-quality protein. It is very important for the growth and maintenance of muscle mass. It contains also a, range, a wide range of fatty acids. Some of them are essential. It also contains lactose for energy. And, of course, you know the story with uh, fat in yogurt. Uh, like for other dairies, uh, it was mentioned before, it, it was a proposed that the saturated fat in dairy might be problematic. But in fact, as you know now, the fat in dairy, even the saturated fats, seems to be cardioprotective. So that's another story we could talk about. But also, yogurt contains, like milk, contains a lot of very important micro and micronutrients. Uh, for example, obviously, uh, calcium and phosphorus are uh, present in high quantity. They're very important constituents uh, of bone minerals and, and, of course, contribute to bone health. And, of course, there's other nutrients like potassium, magnesium, and many vitamins in yogurt, which are essential for health. And finally, of course, in some yogurt, there is probiotic bacteria, and there's always fermented product. For example, proteins are pre-digested in yogurt, and you have fermented peptides, and these small peptides can also be bioactive. As I said before, I'm a basic scientist, but I'm trying to be more translational in my research, so I collaborate with a lot of colleagues. So I did this collaboration with two of my students here, and Dr. Angelo Tremblay, who used a strain of Lactobacillus uh, rhamnosus, uh, which was given to him by Nestle. And Nestle Research uh, did the microbiota investigation in this study. This was a human study where we look at obese men and women. And what is very interesting in that study is that we gave the probiotic during a weight loss program and a weight maintenance program. And as you can see, there's effects that are sex specific in that particular project, which are quite interesting. So very rapidly, this has been published in the British Journal of Nutrition. The reason we also give this prebiotic uh, to uh, these patients or these subjects is that Nestle previously found that the bacteria, the, the, the lactobacillus species we gave, were actually surviving more in the gut if they were taking along with this prebiotic. So this mix was compared, of course, to a placebo that was the same color, same size as the LPR capsules. 250 milligrams of maltodextrin, and of course the same amount of magnesium stearate. And in that particular project, you have the, uh, the design of the study. This was a, a double-blind uh, placebo control study, of course. After a two weeks washout period, the uh, male and female subjects were put on a weight loss uh, protocol for about 12 weeks. And uh, in that protocol, they were restricted in energy by about 500 kilocal per day. Uh, of course, they were followed by nutritionists, by two nutritionists during the project. And after 12 weeks, they were maintained on the uh, probiotic treatment. However, they were no longer on this uh, calorie restriction diet. They were just on the maintenance uh, protocol. So uh, they were followed still by nutritionists, but they were just trying to help them to maintain their weight loss and not recover it. But the probiotic treatment was followed during the whole 24-week period. There was a lot of results. I don't have time to show you all of them. I'm going to summarize the most important uh, slide and especially the most important finding. First of all, there were no effect whatsoever in men uh, that, that, of the probiotic treatment. In fact, when we look at the data at the beginning, we saw no effects until we separated men and women. However, in women, if you compare the loss of, uh, of weight and fat mass of the placebo group as compared to the LPR uh, treated, formulation treated subjects, as you can see, there were a greater loss of weight and uh, of fat mass. And this effect was not only true after 12 weeks, it was also maintained after 20 weeks, 24 weeks. So the effect was maintained even during the maintenance weight period. So that's very important. Not only the probiotic helped to loss further weight during energy restriction, but it also helped to maintain that difference even after the calorie restriction was finished was ended. So the conclusion from this study is that 
Probiotic supplementation can accelerate body weight gain, body weight loss, I'm sorry, in women submitted to energy restriction, but it can also help uh, to the subsequent maintenance phase when energy restriction was not imposed further, so the effect of the probiotic was uh, persisted in that case. The LPR supplementation seems to help obese women to maintain a healthy body weight. Maintain uh, body weight, so that was my last conclusion, sorry. So now I'm going to switch to the other side of the coin, which is the, the, the prebiotic. And to me, as I said before, fruits and in particular berries are a natural match to yogurt for improving diet quality. And it's probably not a coincidence that every time we took a nice picture of our yogurt for marketing purposes, we also put some fruits. Always blueberries, strawberries, or in that case, raspberries. So this study uses C57 black cis regular mice which are, again, maintained on a chow or high-fat, high-sucrose diet, the same diet I've talked to you about. But some of the high-fat-fed animals were also gavage every day with this extract from cranberry. It's an extract that still contains uh, fibers and sugar, but it is enriched more in polyphenolic compounds. Again, it is uh, given by Nutra Canada, which is ensuring that all the times we give this extract, it's really, really well uh, standardized uh, for all the studies we do with this extract. And of course, after eight weeks of treatment, we have done metabolic and inflammatory phenotyping of all these animals. So this is the effect of weight gain and energy intake. As expected, the animals on the high-fat diet gain weight, but this was prevented by giving them the cranberry polyphenolic extract. This was slightly explained by a change in energy intake, a very small but the energy efficiency was also markedly reduced, suggesting an increase in energy expenditure in these animals. Again, when we look at visceral fat and subcutaneous fat, we found that the effect of the cranberry extract was much more at the level of visceral fat. But we also saw that liver triglycerides, which were increased by the high-fat diet treatment in these animals, was prevented by the cranberry extract. What about glucose homeostasis and insulin sensitivity? This is a, a, an insulin tolerance test. As you can see, the animals on the high-fat diet were less sensitive to insulin as compared to the chow-fed animals, but this was uh, prevented partially by the cranberry extract. You have the, the area under the curve here, and this is the well-known OMA index, which is used in humans to characterize uh, insulin resistance. You can calculate it as well in, in mice. And as you can see, this is more insulin resistance in the IFAT-fed animals, and this was prevented by the cranberry extracts as well. What about uh, measures of inflammation? First of all, LPS. LPS is known to increase when the gut permeability is compromised, and indeed in the IFAT-fed animals, we saw an increased LPS level. This was again prevented by the cranberry extract. When we look at triglyceride accumulation in the, in the colon of these animals, this was also increased in the IFAT, prevented by the cranberry extract. And when we look at this inflammatory marker of inflammation in the, in the colon, the NF-kappa-B pathway, this was also increased in the IFAT-fed animals, but prevented after cranberry extract treatment. So what about the gut microbiota? As I've mentioned before, the gut dysbiosis in the intestine here has been shown to uh, be responsible for the increased LPS uh, in the circulation, so we, uh, we already predicted there would be change in the gut microbiota, but do, as you will see, we, will, we were a little bit surprised. So this is, first of all, the gut microbiota change in the regular animals, in the chaffed animals. So this is at zero and one. Zero is the time they came in the animal facility. One week, this is the adaptation period. And then five and nine weeks were the treatment on the diet. Of course, when they were maintained on the child diet, not many change in the gut microbiota. There's more bacteriodides than uh, firmicutes, or a relative proportion of them to be almost equal. However, look what happened in the uh, high-fat-fed animals. As soon as we put them on the high-fat diet at week one, the firmicutes population, uh, of course, family increased at the expense of the bacteriodides. And when we put them on the cranberry extract on the same diet, we were expecting a reversal of the dysbiosis, but this was not the case. They continued to have much more uh, bacteria abundance, which is related to the uh, phylum of the firmicutes at the expense of the bacteriodides, 
but we see another population of bacteria that increases, and all of this increase can be explained by one bacteria, which is an increase in Acromensia mucinifila, which you heard this morning uh, by Dr. Torres, Vinang Torres. So we also see an increase in this very fascinating uh, bacterium, Acromensia mucinifila, when we treat with a prebiotic treatment containing high levels of polyphenols. So in conclusion, to date, we believe it's the first report of a fruit extract exerting a major effect on the presence of acromensia. I'm referring, of course, to the animal studies here. Um, as far as the humans are concerned, I think we, now we have strong evidence that nutritional manipulation of the gut microbiota by berry polyphenols may improve metabolism not only in animals, but probably, we hope, in type 2 diabetic patients which we still have to do. We use uh, insulin resistant, but not type two diabetic individuals. And we believe acromensia is already an interesting biomarker uh, for the impact of phytochemicals and other nutritional interventions for health. And it might be even playing a role into explaining the protection by the prebiotic treatment we give. So my take home message, if you have only one slide that you should remember from my talk, is that eating more yogurt and fruits certainly will improve your nutrition and health. There's now epidemiological evidence for that, there's clinical evidence, and there's even mechanistic studies and animal models to support that concept. And of course, because it contains prebiotic, probiotic that works together to improve health, but it's also very rich in terms of a different type of nutrients, and it contains fermented products like peptides, which I think will also come true in terms of explaining metabolic syndrome prevention uh, with uh, these, uh, with yogurt and berries.